Good morning, and welcome to our study of the book of Revelation. We're studying chapters 2 and 3. Last week, we actually went over the first three churches, the church at uh, Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, and the church at Pergamos. Before we move on to the other churches, I want to review uh, what we had to say about uh, the church at Ephesus. The title of this study is Making the Church Great Again. And as we read about these churches in Revelation, uh, towards the end of the first century, well, they definitely uh, have their problems. The best, of course, being the church at uh, Philadelphia is the best church, and uh, the church at Ephesus certainly had a problem. Remember, uh, Paul had founded uh, the church at Ephesus, and he also wrote uh, the letter uh, to the church at Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. So there's a lot about that particular uh, church in the Bible. And their main problem is that they had left their first uh, love. Uh, and we discussed, well, what is our first love? Well, our first love, I think we concluded last week, was um, loving Jesus, our relationship with Christ that becomes uh, so important to us. And it seems as though perhaps they had waxed uh, cold in their love for God. It's not where it once was. Evidently, they had not completely departed from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, or they would not even uh, be Christians. So he calls that church to repent from where thou art fallen and do the works, or else I will come to thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But as I've been meditating on this church in Ephesus since last week, I think there's more to their problems here than we fully understand. We have to speculate when we talk about Ephesus leaving their uh, first love because the Bible doesn't really say uh, what the scriptures are referring to there. But I was noticing in Paul's uh, address to the elders at Ephesians is uh, farewell address in Acts 20 and verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God, or I commend you to God, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So when we become Christians, of course, we discover we've got a great inheritance. We are the sons of the living God, and our Heavenly Father wants to bless us mightily. And I think there's a lot of understand, misunderstanding, I should say, even today, on what our inheritance is. It goes beyond just being forgiven of our sins and receiving the gift of God, which is eternal life. So let's go to uh, Ephesians chapter 1 to get a better understanding of what our inheritance in Christ is. Starting in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So we want wisdom and the knowledge of God. The scriptures, of course, teach the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. To depart from evil is knowledge, is understanding. And so if we're going to have knowledge of God, it begins with fearing God. Solomon said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For that is the whole duty of man. For every work shall be brought into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches 
of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is. So I think they had lost the conception or maybe never even fully understood what Paul was teaching in Ephesians chapter 1 in their letter. What is the hope of his calling? He's called us out of the world. He's called us to be sons. He's called us to be uh, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people who in times past are not, we're not a people, but we are now the people of God. An inheritance in the saints. So what is our inheritance? Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us work who believe? According to the working of his mighty power. Part of our inheritance is the power of the Holy Spirit within our lives. Acts chapter 1, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and on the other uttermost parts of the earth. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. So we need to know Jesus as he is today at the right hand of the Father, far above all principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. And he's been given a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Too many just simply know Jesus after the flesh. They know the historical Jesus. They know the Jesus of Galilee, but they don't know the Jesus of the throne room, or at least they don't know him as they should, or they have the opportunity for knowing him, who is our advocate at the right hand of the Father, forever making intercession for his church, wanting to continuously endue us with the power of the Holy Spirit in order to spread the gospel throughout the world and establish his church, make the church great, make the church powerful. In verse uh, 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him to the dead and set in his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers, I quoted that verse, and finally in verse 22 and 23, and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. We are the body of Christ. We are members of his body. We are members of his flesh. We are members of his bones. We have this... Uh, we are his hands, we are his feet on the earth. He is the head of the body, and we need to stay connected to him and know him in the power of his resurrection, not simply as he walked as a man, but we need to know the glorified Jesus. We know, need to know the exalted Jesus, and I think this is um, a, a weakness of the church today, and if we're going to make the church great again, we have to have a renewal of this vision and have an understanding of the inheritance we have uh, in the saints. All right, let's move on here to uh, Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 19, where we really left off last week, or verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God, which hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Eyes like flame of fire. This is uh, eyes of judgment. Uh, eyes that can uh, penetrate our hearts, penetrate our minds, know our, our very motive, not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it. And his feet are like fine brass. This also is uh, the fine brass of Jesus' feet, as he is today in his resurrected glory, is a sign of judgment. Verse 19, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works, 
the last to be more than the first. He mentions their works first. And of course, we know that faith always embraces good works. Uh, James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. Verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce thy servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So Paul had warned the elders that grievous wolves would come in and draw many away from the faith, and this had already happened uh, by uh, the end of John's life when he is uh, exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Of course, by this time, uh, Paul is uh, long been departed, as he was, uh, tradition tells us, beheaded in Rome. And yet I give her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Thank God we always have space. We have an opportunity to repent. Should a church, or should we as individuals, uh, fall into sin, God will give us an opportunity. God will give us uh, a, a way to uh, repentance. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then they commit a daughter with her into a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children. My goodness, how severe is this? I will kill her children, and death with death, and all the churches shall know that I am which I am he which searches the reins and the hearts. So he searches the reins and the hearts. He considers our motive. We need to have a pure motive. Uh, we need to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love our neighbor as ourselves. 1 Corinthians 13, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and present my body to be burned, have not charity, have not the love of God, it profits me nothing, I am nothing. Verse 24, but unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put on you none other burden. So some of Thyatira had remained thankful, or had, had remained faithful, thankfully, but that which you have already hold fast till I come so we got to hold on till he comes hold fast to the faith be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord that we might know that our labor in the Lord is not in vain and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nations Another word for overcoming would be a conqueror. According to Romans uh, chapter 8, we're not just conquerors, we're more than conquerors. So we should be walking victoriously over sin. We should have the victory over sin in our own lives a long time ago. So now we can bring uh, victory over sin to the world. We can conquer sin. We can go forth conquering sin, destroying the works of the devil because we have the power of God within us. We understand our inheritance. But we have to endure unto the end. We gotta keep his works. Keep his word, keep his works unto the end. Paul said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. After, lest after I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. So Paul was concerned about even all the great missionary work he had done, that he could end up being a castaway. He had to endure to the end, which of course he did. He said, I fought the good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. 
And these should be our last words of any good Christians. I've finished my course. I've fought the good fight. And Christianity is a battle. Christianity is a fight against evil, against the works of darkness, against sin. In all of these fights, we are more than conquerors. And the promise, if we overcome, is he'll give us power over the nations. He told the church at Ephesus, if they overcome, they could eat of the tree of life. And eat of the tree of life, of course, the tree of life represents Christ. We eat of his flesh. We drink of his blood. We, 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 we suffer with him as he is suffering and grieved over the sin and the weakness of the church. We identify with his suffering. We mourn. We weep over uh, the weaknesses and sins in, in the church today. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my father. So there is a sense in which we should be ruling the nations today. We don't have to wait till the second coming, but we need to occupy until, uh, until he comes. We should be ruling and reigning. Not the world, uh, not, not the secularists, but the Christians, God-fearing men, should be ruling the nations. And I will give him the power of the morning star. So again, two promises here. If we're more than conquerors, if we're overcomers, we'll have power over the nations, and it'll give unto us the morning star. And of course, who is the morning star? Well, of course, the morning star uh, represents uh, Jesus Christ. He is our star. He is the one that guides us through this life, gives us the direction through this life, which will lead to eternal life. Verse 29, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So he's saying this with each church. He that overcometh, will we serve certain promises. He that's the conqueror. He that is the head and not the tail. Will we see promises? And then he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Jesus rebuked the crowd and said to him, what you have ears, but you hear not. And so we need to hear and understand what God has prepared for us if we're going to make the church great again, make the church powerful again, uh, make the church a life-changing institution. Now moving on to chapter 3. And unto the angel of the church at Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest. You have a name for being a lively church, but you're in reality, from God's perspective, a dead church. We talked about these seven spirits in review. What are uh, the seven spirits of God? They're found in Isaiah uh, chapter 11, the seven spirits of God. Let's turn back to Isaiah 11. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, talking about Jesus, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. These are the seven spirits, and we should be emphasizing and sending forth these spirits as we speak God's word, understanding the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. We need to only have wisdom and knowledge. We need to have understanding. A lot of people have the knowledge of God, but they don't have the understanding of God, an understanding of what our inheritance in the saints truly is. Consul 
and might. We are to be a powerful. We are to be a mighty people. We're not to be on the defensive. We're to be on the offensive. We are to be leading the world, not the world leading us. Of course, in the scriptures, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. He's a uh, Spirit of Understanding. He's, he's our light, the light of the world. Verse 2 of chapter 3. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have found thy works, I have not found thy works perfect before God. A regular admonition of the scriptures is watch and pray. So often we have people who, who pray, but they don't watch. We have others who are watching, they're well of this where are the signs of the time? They, they see the problems in the church, the problems in the world, but they, they're not really uh, the intercessors they ought to be. Others are inter interceding, but they don't really get to the uh, core of the social, political, economic problems uh, in society in general and the weaknesses and sins of the church in particular. So we need to live a balanced life, both watching and praying, that we might strengthen the things that remain. There are two basic institutions of a strong country. If we're going to make America great again, we have to make the church great again. And we need to make families great again. And of course, the family is, an, is as an institution is being under attack with divorce and uh, so many young people today on college campuses they have no interest in marrying the women have uh, no interest in having children and so the family is under attack and the church is under attack so we need to strengthen that which has remained certainly we still have strong families and we need to strengthen them even more and we have strong churches in our society today. And we need to encourage them and strengthen them even more. I have not found my ways perfect before God. That's God's standard. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teachers, some pastors for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the perfecting of the saints. The book of Ephesians. Chapter or verse 3 of chapter 3. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast. Again, he had told, told the church at Thyatira, hold fast. What do we the, what what God is saying to the churches uh, at the end of the first century, I believe he's still essentially saying today. That all these churches have the, the some uh, the same problems to various degrees as these churches uh, in Revelation had. Would be perfect. Uh, God's standard is holiness, moral perfection, loving Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Verse 3 Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent, if therefore thou shalt not watch. I will come to thee as a thief. So we need to be watching. He can come as a, a thief and, and bring judgment on us. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now there's a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, they are worthy. So again, like the church of Thyatira, not everyone is in a fallen state. Not everyone is in a black slidden state. There were, there were the faithful remnant uh, in these churches. And again, verse 5, he that overcometh, he that overcometh, he that is a conqueror, more than a conqueror, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, 
that I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And so we want our name being confessed in heaven right now. Behold my faithful servant here. Behold my faithful servant over there. And I'll name him by name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. For a fifth time we find this verse in his message to the churches. Do we have ears to hear? Are we really listening to God? Verse 7, And the angel of the church in Philadelphia, now again, the angel of the church, I believe, are the leaders in the church, or a particular leader in the church. Paul had founded the church at Ephesus. John was a bishop in the church at Ephesus himself. And the ministers are called the stars. We should be the stars, uh, the pastors, the, the leaders of the church, the, the bishops. Not the lawyers, not the politicians be the main stars, but the pastors should be the main stars. Certainly not these Hollywood people. Uh, we had a star just pass from the earth. Uh, evangelist Billy Graham, no doubt is a star. His uh, son, Franklin Graham, is, is, uh, he, he also is a star leading uh, people to make a decision of Christ, for Christ on the West Coast now, trying to bring revival to, uh, country, to states like California, Oregon, who are known for their liberalism and for rejecting God. So here's what he says to Philadelphia. These things saith he which is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. So the primary theme of the book of Revelation is to get an understanding of Christ in the throne room. Christ, as he sits at the right hand of the Father. And we learn, of course, he is holy. Everybody talks about God's love. And as crucial as important that is, the Bible talks a lot more about his holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims, each one having six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did cry, and one cried under another, one cherubim under another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full, filled with his glory. So the church needs to get a, a renewal of a vision of God's holiness. And when we talk about God's love, we need to talk about it in the context of his holiness. Because God is loving and holy, he hates wickedness, he hates sin, he hates evil. And this should be our understanding of how much Jesus really hates sin and it will bring judgment on the world and even on the church for its sin. So he is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And he has the key of David. He is the root and the offspring of David. He is the bright and the morning star. Verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So often we hear people praying, Oh, God, open doors, open this door, open that door. Well, the door is open. Question is, we gonna, are we going to walk through the door? 
years ago, I got a vision after I got saved to go to the campuses. The door was wide open. No one was virtually, no one was proclaiming the gospel publicly in the open air on college and university campuses. Holy Hubert, of course, was doing it. He was still active at the time, mostly on the West Coast. And there were uh, others, the Christian Brothers Church in Southern California, uh, Brother Jim Weber, and a few others. And, but the door was wide open. And so you got to walk through that door and proclaim the gospel. That's what I did. The door was open. And no man can shut it. I've been born since I've been on the campuses for four and a half decades that, well, free speech is shutting down. Free speech is shutting down. Well, that really hasn't proven to be the case. There's always a, a battle to fight. There's always people that will want to shut you down, but essentially free speech is still prevailing on our college and university campuses. Mm -hmm. So we got to walk through the door, lift up our voice, and sound the trumpet. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So just a little strength. We can do great things. We have the faith the size of a mustard seed. We can accomplish great works for God. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. This is dealing with the conflict between the Judaizers who are trying to put the Gentile converts under the rites and rituals of Judaism, the ceremonial law. Paul would have none of that. And at this time in church history, God was uh, certainly favoring the Gentiles. The Gentiles were coming into God's kingdom in mass. The Jews rejected this. A lot of these Judaizers they did acknowledge Jesus, the Messiah, but they had a problem accepting these Jews or accepting the Gentiles into uh, God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So we will be tried, we will be tested. The Bible says in Matthew 4, the Spirit of God drove Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So Jesus was tempted by the devil, but he overcame with the Word of God. We can be overcomers with the Word of God and the Word of our testimony and the blood of Jesus. These factors enable us to be overcomers, more than conquerors. And we come out of these trials and tests and tribulations. As we pass every test, we become stronger men. We become stronger women, as reflected in the life of Job. Perhaps before Christ, no man was ever tempted like Job. And God restored everything he had lost twofold. Because he, he passed the test. Behold, I come quickly, or suddenly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So we, we should be wearing a crown now. You know, we should be ruling and reigning with him now. And so the unbelievers, the skeptics, want to take away our crown. And we have to be in the background. We're not to take our religion out in the public square. Keep your religion to yourself. Keep your religion within the four walls of a building. Don't bring it out here in the public square. Don't bring it to Washington, D.C. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. There's an old expression about a particular person 
these shirts, they say he's a pillar in the church, a leader in the church. Maybe he held every office in the church. He's the one highly responsible for keeping the doors of the church open, a pillar of the church. We need pillars in our church, pillars in the temple of God, people that are strong, that are steadfast, that are un unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord. These are the pillars. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. A lot of the early settlers in America considered America to be the New Jerusalem. God was doing something new in America. I believe that's true. He wanted to do something new. Uh, America was to be a, a city on a hill. This is one of the themes of, of uh, Ronald Reagan's campaigns and presidency, to make America, once again, a city on a hill. Uh, of course, Trump, same theme with it, make America great again, a new Jerusalem, uh, a beacon under the world, a beacon of freedom, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will ride upon him, my new name. Then here it is again, for the sixth time. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. And the Spirit is speaking to the churches today through this teaching we're giving on Revelation. And we need to hear what the Spirit is saying. And not just be hearers, but doers. A lot of people don't even hear. Some hear, but they don't do. We gotta be doers. We gotta put this into practice. We understand what our inheritance is. He has put all things under the feet of Jesus, and since we are his body, and he's the head of the body, as we get our direction and guidance from him, evil can be put under our feet. We'll trample on uh, devils and demons will be under our feet. And this is what we should rejoice in, not just rejoice in our personal salvation, but we need to have a vision for the church, to build a great church, a mighty church. that will be a, 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 a lighthouse, a, a beacon of, of uh, freedom and spirituality. In verse 14. So if we're conquerors, again, according to the uh, uh, church here at uh, Philadelphia, uh, we can uh, be pillars, pillars in the church. Really, the church is the New Jerusalem. And unto the angel of the church at Laodiceans, right, these things saith the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, oh, the creator. Jesus is the creator. He's the one that said, let there be light, and light was. The faithful and true witness. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Well, the problem with the church at uh, Laodicea was it was lukewarm. And I'm afraid we have a lot of uh, lukewarm believers today. We need to get on fire with God. He would prefer that we be cold than lukewarm. On the day of Pentecost, they were baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. A lot of Pentecostals, a lot of Charismatics that speak of being filled with the Holy Ghost. But where's the fire? We don't really see the consuming fire. Our Lord is a consuming fire. 
And fire should consume sin. Fire should consume all the wickedness and all the evil in the church and in society in general. We're firemen. We're to put out sin. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So they thought at Laodicea that they were the forefront of what God is doing. We're at the forefront of what God is doing in these last days. A lot of people think that. But that's not necessarily what the Spirit of God thinks or what Jesus thinks. We might think we're all right when God considers us wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. So what to, what to do about it? We find in verse 18, this is God's counsel. Remember, he's given us the spirit of counsel and a might. It's one of the seven spirits. So this is this counsel. Let's get our consultation from God. To buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. So it's these tests, these trials, these tribulations. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So we can be overcomers as we trust in him. Tests and trials and tribulations will come our way. And as we walk through these, we become stronger in the faith. We become clothed with the robes of righteousness that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. So we're seeing into the spiritual realm. This is where John is taking us. John is taking us to the throne room of God that we might see him and it's exalted and glorified state not the carpenter's son uh, walking the sea of Galilee we don't want to lose that that's part of Jesus history but that's not what he is today he's the exalted he's the glorified uh, he's the ascended Lord as many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Verse 19, I, I doubt if a day go, days go by on the campus that I don't quote, quote this verse at least once. Uh, probably several times in my public proclamation. Then when Christians come up to me on the sidelines, when maybe Cindy or Brother Mikel is preaching, they'll say, you're not showing love, you're not showing love. Uh, and I'll say, well, part of showing love is rebuking. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. It takes more than just rebuking, chastening, discipline. We need discipline in our churches today. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So calling people to repentance is a manifestation of love. Granted, it's tough love. But the lukewarm church at Laodicea is much like the church today. They don't want to call people to repentance, to turn from their sin, to have the mind of Christ. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, the big if, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. So he's given the church at Laodicea also space to repent. He's knocking at the door. They think they're spiritual giants, but they've basically locked Jesus out. They've locked the Spirit of God out for their many programs. 
So you must open the door. We must open the door of our hearts. We must open our eyes that we might see. We must open our ears and really start listening to what the Spirit of God is saying. And we'll sup with him and he with me. I notice on my news feed, regularly I get uh, invitations uh, from Donald Trump to send in your name and, and, and you can come in to Washington, D.C. And, and have supper with him, have dinner with him. Well, I, I suppose that'd be a great thing to do. I'd certainly like to do that. Uh, but we have this opportunity to have supper with Jesus Christ himself. He will sit down with us. We can sit at his table. We can sit at his table now. And we should be sitting at the table, getting counsel from him, getting direction from him now, not at some time in the future, not 2,000 years from when uh, John wrote this, but it was available to the church at John's time, and it's still available to us today. We can enter into the throne room, and we sit with him in the throne room. Are you sitting with him in the throne room? Or just simply sitting in your pews at a church. When we're only sitting at the table, we'll be activated. Jesus is always active. He wants us to be always active, doing the first works. Which the church at Ephesus had failed in doing the first works. And of course, our first work should be evangelizing the world bringing the world under the authority of Christ and under the authority of his church because we represent Christ on earth. To him that overcometh, it is for the seventh time, to him that overcometh, Will I grant to sit with me in my throne? What a promise. We can sit with him in his throne now. Spiritually speaking, we are sitting with him. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting on the throne of God where his body, we sit there with him. And we need to learn to, through our prayer life to enter into this realm. Even as I also overcame. So Jesus had to overcome. He had to overcome tests. He had to overcome trials. He had to overcome temptations. And so do we. And he's given us the example. He overcame everything. He was tempted in all ways like we are, yet he was without sin. So we'll be tempted. But we can be without sin as we trust in him, as we sup with him as we enter into the throne room of God. So the worst church of the seven is the church at Laodicea. Yet, the greatest promise is given to this world, worst church. The other ones had wonderful problems rule over the nations, uh, eating of the tree of life, being a pillar in the church. Those were all wonderful promises. But this promise is we can sit in the very throne of God. We sit with him. Spiritually speaking, we sit with him now. This isn't that something we have to wait for from 2,000 years from now. Now it's true. Now we look through a glass darkly. Then when we see face to face. But most people aren't even looking through the glass darkly. We have a sort of a dim view. And John is trying to give us a greater view, a greater revelation of Christ as he's in his throne room. So we can be like that Christ. Not necessarily just like the Christ that, that, that walked and talked along the uh, Sea of Galilee. But we see Christ in all of his victory as the one who is more than a conqueror and has sat down at the right hand of the Father. We need to see that Christ and be like him. This is our inheritance. Let's receive that inheritance now. Not wait until death. And 
and it's available. And it's through repentance. We got to repent and seek his counsel. Verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Well, Father, we're here to listen. To what the Spirit says to the church. We're to be slow to speak, slow to wrath, and swift to hear. But I think we're often swift to speak and slow to hear. Lord, enable us to hear your voice, to hear your voice through the written word, hear the living word speak to us through Jesus Christ, through his throne room, through where he is today. Lord, that we'll have this baptism of fire that was given on the day of Pentecost. Lord, there will be more than conquerors here on earth. That the church will rule and reign once again. Lord, at one time, the church was stronger in America and one of our strongest cultural influences. But it seems to generally wane today. We're going to make America great again, Lord. Help us and give us the understanding how we can make the church great again, how we can make our families great again, and stand by and see the salvation of the Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That we, was wonderful. We will be uh, teaching again uh, uh, next uh, Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. Be sure to tune in, live stream, as we'll be covering Revelations 4. I actually hope to cover two chapters next week, Revelation 4 and 5. Amen. So glad you did it over. It's great.